Um, so my name is Steve Jensen, and the presentation is analyzing reversing iOS apps with IRAT. Some of you may have heard of IRAT, some of you may have not. IRAT is a tool kit that I created. It's basically a container and a GUI to uh, help pen testers uh, use the industry tools that are out there, and it kind of works together with those and kind of presents the feedback and uh, the results in a pretty little format. Uh, I'm a principal consultant with Veracode. Uh, my background is I was a former .NET developer for Jack Henry and Associates. Some of you may know what that is. Uh, I was born and raised here in Kansas City. I moved away to Joplin about 14 years ago, and that's where I lived now. Uh, I rode the fence for quite a while between application development and application security, uh, and then eventually jumped the fence into application security full time in about 2007. Uh, I've been doing application security uh, for about 10 years, and I've been doing mobile uh, penetration testing for about the last six or seven, since about 2009. Um, I have done numerous vulnerability uh, disclosures, trying to make them responsible, um, for a variety of industries, including airlines, banks, credit laundry agencies, uh, things like that. Um, so the target audience, what, this presentation is really targeted to two main groups. Number one are people who actually do iOS penetration testing, or they want to learn how to do iOS penetration testing, or they work for a company that does iOS penetration testing, and for mobile developers, anybody that develops uh, iOS applications themselves. Um, so I'm going to do two things tonight. The first thing I'm going to demonstrate is how we do a kind of walk through an overview of traditional iOS pen testing. Then I'm going to introduce the tool kit that I created to demonstrate how it kind of automates all those manual tasks. and it, it's, it's a much more efficient process. The second thing I'm going to do when I post it on Twitter uh, is I'm going to dump the source code of an application in less than two minutes. Now, I'm going to caveat that with the fact that it'll take longer than two minutes because I'd like to kind of explain what I'm doing. But the way that I'm going to do that is going to be associated with uh, known weaknesses within third-party mobile development frameworks. When we develop iOS applications, traditionally we develop them using native Objective-C, using Xcode. However, there are numerous uh, uh, mobile development applications or mobile development frameworks on the market now that allow developers to uh, write the code once and then compile and target multiple platforms. But these mobile development frameworks come with the name. I'm not going to call it a vulnerability, but I'll call it a weakness. And we'll see what those weaknesses are as we move forward. So I kind of just walked through that. I'm going to do a live demo. That could be dangerous. <laughs> so I'll keep my hands crossed and hopefully nothing fails. So with traditional iOS penetration testing, we use a lot of industry standard tools. Uh, there's obviously a standard methodology that corporations and, and individuals use to do this type of testing. And these are this is a list of some of the common tools. The last one there is not so common. But we use O-Tool to analyze the binary. We can determine if the binary is encrypted. We can determine if uh, stack smashing protection is enabled. We can determine if PI position independent executable is enabled to prevent buffer overflow attacks against the binary, things like excuse me, things like that. Uh, there's another tool out there by it's created by Patrick Toomey, and it's called Keychain Number. Basically, what it allows you to do is it allows you to analyze the keychain on the device uh, for any type of whatever information is in there. You'd be surprised at what, uh, what is actually kept in there. Uh, another one is obviously SQLite. Both developers and pen testers use this tool to interact with databases. We use SQL, uh, pen, pen tester, we use SQLite to actually dump the content of a database to see if there's any sense of information. Uh, dump encrypted, we will use to actually, uh, if a binary is encrypted, which it generally is, during the runtime process when it is loaded into memory, the architecture of the device will actually decrypt that binary and go, go about doing its thing. In its uh, RESTful state, it is encrypted. However, this dump decrypted tool, which is created by Stefan Ezer, uh, utilizes uh, the process that he does that will automatically decrypt that binary. Before this tool, we had to do it manually. We had to gauge the offset, we had to calculate the size, and then we had to go in and, and do a bunch of stuff manually. Uh, the second to last one there is class dump Z. After we decrypted the binary, we can actually start dumping the class information. 
So we can identify classes and methods that are contained within the binary. It's kind of it's almost like doing a, a high level uh, reverse engineer. The other thing we can do with class MC is actually we can dump the headers. When you dump the class info, you're actually dumping the entire contents into a file. At which point you're going to have to drag through and walk through all the classes that are there on the methods. By dumping the headers, we can actually separate all of those classes out into individual files, and we can start looking through those individual files and methods that may be interesting within those. And then the last uh, tool here is Theos. It's not a common tool that's used. Uh, Theos is really a development framework. It can actually be used to reverse engineer apps. It can be used to actually develop apps without using Xcode. Theos was created by a guy named Dustin Howell. I'm uh, not sure if anybody knows who that is, but it is my go-to tool for iOS reverse engineering. It's the most powerful tool I've found that does what I need to do. Some people use Ida, some people do use Hopper. I much prefer this. Uh, some people use Cypress, and one of the tools I'm going to talk about here in a minute uses it. But Theos for me, and I think for a lot of people to do this, this is the best tool out there. It's free, and it's the best tool out there for doing what uh, this, this more advanced and depth reverse engineering. I'm sorry, my mouth is a little dry and I'm a little hoarse because I was at a little bit game yesterday. Now, nothing makes you yell more than seeing nine kids chasing the same ground ball. <laughs> So there are already a couple of tools, or four tools to be exact, uh, out there that do some sin, semblance of uh, analysis on iOS. The first one is Analyzer. That was actually the uh, influence for the iRed tool. I used it. I caveat that. I tried to use it, uh, and it didn't really work for me. I don't know if I had a configuration issue or whatever it was. But I reverse engineered it as much as I could to see how it worked. And I liked how it worked. I liked how it interacted, and so I kind of used the foundation in that to as the foundation for the IRET tool. Uh, Analyzer will actually kind of go through and, and analyze, or analyze uh, various pieces of information associated with the application. Uh, Snoopit is another tool. Uh, it is one of the only tools listed up here that actually does a bit of reverse engineering. It actually works more like a debugger. You actually hook to the process and can set breakpoints. At which point you can uh, modify information as you go. Uh, for example, if you want to, if, if you use Snoopit on a binary that detects jailbreak detection, uh, you can actually set a breakpoint, and instead of having it return true when it identifies as jailbreak, you can actually change that variable to false, and, and it would uh, proceed forward. So it, it does a little bit of reversing, but it's more of a debugger. Uh, IntroSpy kind of does analysis as well. It doesn't do any reverse engineering. Uh, it will actually uh, detail some cryptography stuff for you, uh, read the keychain for you, identify various pieces of information. Uh, IDB, the last one here by Daniel Mayer, who's with Montesano, uh, really good guy. Um, he, is, he actually released his tool about two months before I did, and it took the wind out of my sentence. Because I thought all my work was for nothing, but then after looking at his tool, I realized mine did some things that they did. Uh, but his, is, his does really good binary analysis. Uh, he uses USB Mux D, which means the, uh, the device is connected via USB and you interact with it that way. My, my toolkit requires Wi Fi, unfortunately, for those who don't have Wi Fi, but Wi Fi is available pretty much anywhere. So these are all great tools, and I've used all of them to one extent or another, except for Finalizer, which didn't seem to work for But they didn't end up doing everything that I found that I needed to do. It did a little bit of this, it did a little bit of that, but in the end I found that I still had to go back to doing some of the manual stuff I had to do. The manual reversing, the manual analysis. Um, so that's why I created the IRET tool. So what it does, more than just the then more than just the analysis, it does hardcore reverse engineering. And I can dump, like I said earlier, I can dump the contents of an application in two minutes or less. So it really changes the game when it comes to uh, pen testing iOS apps. And that's why I created it. So iRed itself is just a Debian package. Uh, it actually consists of an iOS Objective-C application, which is the GUI on the device. And then it has several shell scripts written in Bash. And then it has kind of a Python-based web server listing uh, that listens on a port number that uh, you can actually connect to and start interacting with those shell scripts. Uh, so once we once this Debian package is installed on the device, or copied over to the device using something 
like an SFTP client. We can actually install it using iFile or simply using the dpkg uh, installation command. After it's been installed, uh, we simply respring the device, at which point you would get your little IRA icon on the device. Now, for troubleshooting purposes, obviously IRA depends on other things like icon being installed, depends on Perl being installed on the device. So, for troubleshooting purposes, when you first install it, you'll probably want to manually start the listener. That way, you can actually start seeing the information there. If there is an error, it will tell you that it's missing Python. Actually, it wouldn't even run if it was missing Python, so that's the easiest way. Uh, but if it's missing file or said or any of these other dependencies, it would tell you as it moves through, and then you can stop, you can install those new. However, once you're installed and you restrain the device, you have this little IRET toolkit icon. Now, I want to make clear that it, this is not a tool, it's a toolkit. I wanted to call it a toolbox, but I was overruled by people who told me that was stupid. So, <laughs> but, but essentially, it is a toolbox, because if we look back at all those tools that we use, this is simply a container that encapsulates all those tools on all these. It does it, on its own without those tools, it does nothing. Do I have to jailbreak the iPhone? Yes. Yes, this is only uh, this can only be installed on jailbroken device because simply it needs root permissions to do what it needs to do. So once we uh, once we have the iRAD toolkit uh, icon up there, we can simply launch it like any other app on the device. And we will be greeted with the screen that is in the middle. That this basically is some text that tells you, hey, you're here. Thanks for coming. And then you, uh, to get it started, you just hit the start. What that does is it creates a port listener on the device that you can then navigate to via your browser. And that last one will tell you, navigate your browser to this location. Let me do the live demo. <laughs> we'll see if this works. Yeah, it'll work. <laughs> so, as you can see, here is, here's my demo test device. I have IRET installed and I have it running. It's telling me to listen on a, listen on a particular port, or I'm sorry, navigate to a particular IP address and the port, which I have done right here. So this is the actual landing page for the application. Besides having the dependencies that are required to actually run the application, we now also have dependencies that are required to actually use the functionality. So if you want to use OTool, the binary analysis, you've got to have OTool installed. If you want to decrypt the data or decrypt the binaries, you've got to have the, those tools installed in order to actually use the functionality. Because like I said, it's a container, it's not an actual tool. Design. On the right-hand side, we have a drop-down menu and this drop-down menu is, a, is the list of all of the iOS applications that are currently installed, currently installed on the device. These applications are apps that you would install via iTunes or the App Store, and they're located on the uh, device under bar mobile application. And they're, they're pretty easy to identify. Um, so we see there's a variety of applications there. The one I'm going to select is the Smart Option. And what it's doing right now behind the scenes is it's running all of those OTool commands automatically. And there are a multitude of them. There are at least four or five uh, commands that we have to run to identify header information and additional information. So now it's been returned, and we can see that it dumps the headers for us. We can, tell, we can see that the binary supports the R version 7 architecture. It is also have high enabled, which is position independent executable to prevent bug or attacks. We can see that uh, it does implement stack smashing protection. For those who are familiar with, it basically puts a Canary on the stack to make sure the stack has been modified or changed. Uh, we see that it does not implement the ARC. The ARC is automatic resource counting, and it is a memory protection. Uh, and it does not, so this, as a pen tester, we would identify this as a vulnerability. And we would uh, write it up. The last one over here on the left is the encryption info. Down here at the bottom, uh, we see the encrypt ID is zero. This tells us, when it's zero, it tells us it's not an encrypted binary. Uh, it's, if it were one, it would, it would be encrypted and we would have to do, or as we go forward, it would do additional things. Uh, the second tab here is the keychain analysis. This automates the keychain dump work factor to tool. 
Now what it does when we, when Patrick Tumit, when he released the tool, there were multiple commands that had to be executed to identify various pieces of information within the function. We can identify certificates and keys and generic passwords and internet passwords. Each one of those is an individual manual command we're going to have to type. The tool automates all of those commands for us. So we can actually step through and read the content of the keys within the keychain, which is, if you're looking at it, it's quite boring. We can look at the entitlements, which is also boring. Then we can look at the generic passwords. The generic passwords are actually quite interesting because this is where the generic and internet passwords is where iOS developers will actually store information in the keychain. If they're going to store a username and password, this is where they're going to store it. We also see that Apple likes to store stuff in the keychain as well. Uh, the internet passwords, this is where you can see some data there. Um, if we scroll down, for a particular test that I did on this device, the application itself stored the URL for the host that I was testing. It stored the username that I was using, and it stored the password associated. So given a situation where you have a device that is stolen, this type of information is actually contained within keychain and easily, easily accessible by an attack. So if you, the big issues that, that are out there are like banks storing sensitive information and things like that. And this can all be accessible by an attack. One of the interesting things if, you're, if we go back through the generic is, if I scroll down to find it, all of the Wi-Fi connections that you connect to uh, with your device are actually stored in the keychain, this one right here, the, the service is called Airport. That identifies that this is a Wi-Fi connection. And the Wi-Fi SSID was FBI surveillance name. This is my personal home Wi-Fi. Um, and then the password for the Wi-Fi is right there. So you have a scenario where you steal somebody's device, now you have access to all the Wi-Fi hotspots that they have connected to, and the passwords, and you just have to locate where they are. As we move forward with the database analysis, any database associated with the selected application will be pre-populated into this drop-down. Uh, and all we need to do at this point is select the database. SQLite is then automated behind the scenes to grab all the database information, all the tables, and all the content. We see very simply that you know, these are the four tables that are within that database, and then here's some information associated with that. One of the things to, to, to see here is obviously there are no header columns. So we don't know what columns there are. I did that specifically because, and I'll reiterate this at the end, this, is, this toolkit is not a panacea for all of your testing. You still have to do your due diligence outside of the tool. So I wanted to kind of make sure that people who are using the database, they're not, they're not only using this tool to analyze it, because there's much more information to identify if you open the database in a text editor, or if you open it in a text editor, and you can identify additional information that you're not going to find. All this is to do is to identify potential information that may be sensitive for your application that way you can do a little bit more dig or, uh, deep digging to identify any additional information. <laughs> I'm not going to yell that much at the next game I go to. Uh, the Log Viewer tab, it, it serves two purposes. The first thing is that it will allow you to read the last 100 lines of the system log. If we are testing an application and it's in debug mode, it's probably writing information to the system log. And it could be writing names, passwords, uh, URLs, whatever. Uh, the second thing it does, similar to the database tab, is it will actually identify any text files or log files associated with the selected application, populate those in the dropdown, and then all we need to do is select it, and then we can read the contents of it. This is just simply a licensing file associated with the component that the application utilizes. The plist viewer, or property list as they're known, these are kind of the brains, the config files for iOS applications. Um, 
the, the number one the, the number one keyless file that is utilized is called the info.keyless. It kind of is the config file. So all of your configuration information is generally going to exist in there. So any keyless files that identifies are going to be populated into this uh, dropdown. Now keep in mind that some of these applications they may have one or two keyless files. They may have 50. They may have 100. This one has quite a few. But the one we want to look at is the info keyless. And when we look at this keyless file, we can actually start walking down through. We can see various things like um, was this created uh, by a third-party mobile development framework? Yes, it was because the app base is Tony. Tony is a third-party mobile development framework that is out on the market that will allow developers to write once, deploy it for many. You can also identify uh, additional things. There's obviously images in here. We can identify. The CF bundle identifier. The CF bundle identifier is very important when we start doing reverse engineering because this is really the identifier that is used at the end of that running process. When the process runs, that's what it's denoted as. So when we build a VO tweak, as we're going to do here in a minute, we actually have to make sure that we include that uh, CF bundle identifier so when the tweak is built and it's ready to run, it knows what process to target. You can see additional information. This particular binary was targeted for the iOS uh, iPhone platform as opposed to the iPad. We can see uh, down here um, the minimum OS version is 4.3. I'm actually testing this on a 6.1 device right now. Uh, it's, I believe it's an iPhone 4S for a 6.1. So the info about keyless holds a lot of information that an attacker or a penetration tester can, can garner to, to start doing additional attacks uh, to identify uh, how, how binary is created, what tools were used to create, and if we know that those tools have weaknesses, which this one does, we can then start exploiting those weaknesses. I'm going to skip the header files and the PS files for now, and I'm going to jump to the last one here. When you close an application, a snapshot is taken of the last image or the last appearance of that application on the device. And that is saved into a location within the application. Uh, that way, when you launch the application again, it's going to use that image as a transition, animation transition, while it's loading the application in the background. Once that's done, it will load the application and that image will disappear. What this will do, if we select this, there is no application. Oh, yeah, there is. Uh, so this was the last image that was seen uh, before the application was closed. And when the application is relaunched, this is the image that will be displayed while the application is loading into the background and recover itself. These can usually lead to sensitive information exposure uh, because if you close it on the login page or any type of page within the application that contains sensitive information, it's cached and we can do it. These next two tabs are really where the tool sets itself apart from anything else out there in the industry. Uh, the Theos tab and the header tab, they work together. Theos, like I said, is a development framework that allows you to create applications without Xcode, but it is also a, 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 a development framework that allows us to create tweaks and actually reverse iOS applications. And there are basically four things, four pieces of information that we need to do within the IREC tool to create a Theos tweak. We need to provide the project name, which is anything you want. We need to provide the package name, which is anything you want. The author name, and then that bundle ID that I referenced earlier that is very important reversing. I'm not worried about remembering that. The tool remembers it for you and loads it automatically. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to walk through the process. This would take me less than two minutes to actually create the tweet, add the code, restring the device, and dump the source code. But I'm going to walk through it a little bit. So it's going to take a little bit, maybe two minutes and 15 seconds. So we're going to tell it our project name. We're going to give it our package name. 
We're going to get the old domain, which is just me. That's all we need to do. We hit submit. Behind the scenes, it's executing all the Theo's commands that it needs to do to create the tweet, create all the files associated with it, and then it, uh, this information up here at the top is actually our confirmation network. Down here below in this dropdown, it provides us two files associated with the Theo's tweet. The first one is the main file, and the second one is the tweakxm. The tweakxm is where the actual Execution, the code that we're going to put that is executed, that's where that's going to go. I'm going to have to type here real quick. So we're going to load the makexit file. I'm sorry, the make file. Uh, and there are two things that we need to specify. The first thing we need to specify is we need to specify the architecture that we are targeting. And for this device, it is our, our ARM version 7 architecture. So we simply type in How we have to type it. And the second thing we have to tell it is the target, the platform target. In this case, it's an iPhone. Uh, the platform target will be separated by columns. You're going to tell it the platform that it's targeting. You're going to tell it what compiler, unless it's going to default to a specific compiler. And then you're going to tell it the version of the SDK that you're going to be targeting. So we're going to do an export. We're going to tell it iPhone. Maybe capitalize It's this. That's what we want. We're going to tell it the platform is an iPhone. We're targeting the latest or default compiler to compile the actual app or the compile tweet. And it's targeting the 6.1 SDK. The rest of this stuff is really just default information that Theos creates so we can find the files that it needs to use to do its compilation process. At this point, we simply save it, and it tells you, hey, your changes are set. And then we can actually go to the make file. I'm sorry, the tweet.exit file. Now, the content that you see here actually kind of tells you the format of this tweet.exit file. So you're going to start out with a hook, percent hook, which tells you the class name after this is the class name that we want to hook into. We're going to target the specific CF bundle identifier of the running process. And then when this class gets loaded, we're going to hook into this class. And then we're going to target this particular method. Make sense? So for now, we're going to stop right here. And we're going to jump over to the header tab. Now, one of the cool things that Theos does is when you dump the headers of an application, when you dump the headers of an application, you can actually uh, use Theos. It has a logify script. Now, what you do is you pass the header name, the header file name, to that logify script, and it will actually output you uh, the proper format that the Theos tool understands to actually start logging information contained within that method. So if we, take a, if we take a look at one of these header files, it's going to come back in a different format than you may be used to seeing as part of, you know, if you were to, to take a look at a typical iOS header file. Because it's, it's going to match the format that is expected by Theos. It's going to have the percent of, this is the class name that it's going to hook into. And these are the various methods associated with that class that we can actually start logging information against. Now, the KCDC developer conference is tomorrow, right? And there are going to be a couple of sessions there where they talk about developing iOS for mobile applications using a variety of mobile development frameworks. One of them is Xamarin, which uh, it, you can actually write mobile apps in .NET. This one, uh, I don't know what the other talk is. I think it's kind of an overview. It didn't target a specific mobile platform or a mobile framework. The application, the third-party mobile framework, this is created, this application is created in, is Kony. And you can create applications in Kony using either JavaScript 
or little. This particular application is created using JavaScript, which means the developer wrote all of the source code in JavaScript. They then compiled it, and when they compiled it, it created an iOS binary. But it's part of that process where we go from JavaScript to Objective-C being able to run on a native code or a native platform. We have to have some type of way to identify the conversion. So within, within these coding mobile apps that use JavaScript, within the .app directory, there is a JS scripts directory right here. And within that directory, there is an app underscore script.js file. This is the source code for the application. The only problem is, it's encrypted. So we can't really do anything with it in its current form. So, we're re so we have to create a DOS we can reboot to engineer it and try to get into some semblance of uh, code that we can actually read. So within the header files, because we were talking about a JS scripts, there's a JS script loader header, which is right here. This is the brains of that operation, that conversion process. When we select that, it's going to return the class info and the methods that are contained within this. And within there, there's a particular script or a particular method that we want to look at that actually does the conversion for us. We see we have some. Our first one here is the contents of the JS scripts directory. That is the directory we just looked at. That finds that JS file. And then it loads it in memory. We have some deallocation method. We have some unarchiving. Uh, load JS scripts. That, kind of, that basically loads the JavaScript file for us. The one that actually does the operation that we want is the evaluate script. What it's going to do is once that JavaScript file is loaded in memory, this method runs to convert that encrypted information to decrypted JavaScript that the application understands to build the UI. So the simple thing that we do here is we can we're going to copy this format. We come back over to our videos. Come back over to our tweakxm. We're going to delete that. We're going to paste that in. That's all we got to do. But we don't want to log all of this information. We just want to target this one particular script that we're looking at. I'm sorry, one particular method. Now, if we were to save this right now and build it, we restring the device and we run the application, what would happen if we looked at the console, the console is where we can kind of analyze the, the information that's going on in the device. We launch Xcode and we go into the console, it will actually start dumping a ton of JavaScript. But we wouldn't want to do that. We really want to, we don't want to have to go through and, and kind of grab through all of that stuff. We want it nice, neat, and pretty. So what I did was I wrote, some custom code, for those of you that don't speak Objective-C, now Theos is going to allow us not only to log information, it's going to allow us to inject our own custom code into that running process. We can inject our custom code either to run in conjunction with the original developer written code, or we can actually overwrite what the developer wrote and run our custom code. And the deciding factor is this little parameter right there. That basically says, run the original code that was there as well. If it's removed, it will run this code only and it will ignore everything that the developer wrote. Which would kind of be cool if you wanted to hook into a method that uh, that implemented certificate pinning and you wanted to override it so it didn't, you know, bypass the certificate pinning. Or if we wanted to uh, target a mobile banking app that every time you did the transfer to your bank, 
I inject a custom code that will also skim some money off your transfer and put it in my account. So as long as we have the the dot or the uh, percent board parameter there, it's going to run the original code as well in conjunction with our uh, custom code. So like I said, for those of you who don't speak Objective-C, basically what this does is it's going to take two parameters. It's going to take a file name, which is actually the name of the JavaScript file, such as a.js. Then it's going to pass a script, which is the actual JavaScript that the developer wrote. And what it's going to do is it's going to build that file and then dump that script content into that file, and then move on to the next file. And it's going to do that until all of those JavaScript files within that encrypted file are done. Once, it's, uh, once that's done, once these parameters come in, we're going to create the JS files directory within the documents directory. And within that directory, this is where we're going to create our files. We're going to take the file name, we're going to create a file, then we're going to take the content of that script, and we're going to write it into that file. And it does take some time to build it because it's got to actually do all that stuff, and then it actually it automates the compilation process and then it automates the actual copying of it to the directory. So we see down here below the tweak has been built and it's installed in library mode substrate and dynamic libraries. And we can confirm this if we come back to our device, we go to library, mobile substrate, dynamic libraries, there's our ally.js file that we just created with a timestamp of 8.52. So we know we created it properly and it went through uh, the copy it where it needed to be. So at this point, we actually want to test our video suite we created. Here's the documents directory. We see that there's nothing in there. I'm going to refresh. We see there's nothing there. I'm going to go ahead and stop the application, the iRed application on the device. Now that we've copied the tweak into the mobile substrate directory, we have to respring the device so that the software is refreshed and it can identify that tweak we just added. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to respring the device, which will take eh, probably 10 seconds or so. Basically, refreshes the uh, all of the software on it. Back up. And the smart auction is here, the last icon on the second row there. All we have to do, launch the application. Once the login page comes up, the process is done. It's done. It's run our tweak. Now all we have to do is make sure that it worked. So what we do, we're back in our documents directory here. We're going to refresh. You see we have our JS files directory that was created. And now we have all of our JavaScript files. Now, that's that's pretty unique. That's pretty cool that it created all those files. There's about 111 files it created. But what we can do now is if we open these files, we've now dumped the developer source code of the application. At which point we can start going through and doing a source code review to identify potential vulnerabilities that we couldn't identify uh, as part of that dynamic process. So, like I said earlier, the IRA tool is a container. It just simply is a GUI to interact with these other tools to make the testing, uh, it automates them, it makes it more efficient, and it makes it easier to do more advanced reverse engineering. Uh, and obviously that last point is the important one. It's not a thing I see it for everything. You still have to do your due diligence and you do your testing. You can get, IRA is released on, uh, it, it, I actually released it back in March. Uh, through Veracode, uh, but I just put it on GitHub. It's freely accessible. It's not associated with any product or service offered by Veracode. It is released under the GPL license and free for anybody. The source code and everything else is out there. If you have any questions or concerns and it's not working for you, hit me up at uh, that email address or hit me up on Twitter. I'll be glad to help you. Appreciate your time. Thanks.